Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this episode UFO Landings and Humanoids. Seven Spectacular Cases. Pretty excited about this episode today. Each one of these cases involves a UFO landing and humanoids. These cases reach back all the way to the 50s up to the 2010s. In fact, I've included one case from each decade, one from the 1950s, 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010s. It's one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode today, because this will show that this is an ongoing phenomenon, one that's been going on for a very long time and is still going on. And I think it also shows that this phenomenon is absolutely global, worldwide. The cases I'm going to present today come from all over the world. And another reason I wanted to do this video is because many of these cases involve messages from the ETs, interactions, conversations that people had with the extraterrestrials. And it shows their agenda on our planet, why they're here, what they have to say. So these cases are pretty exciting. Some of them are quite unusual. I wanted to choose cases that I think have something unique or significant to contribute to our understanding of this phenomenon. So let's just get started. The first case occurred on August 25, 1952 at 5.35 a.m. This case occurred in Frontenac, Kansas. And the main witness is William Squires. He worked at a radio station as a musician and singer. And he was driving along Yale Road. This is about a quarter mile from US Highway 160. And he was on his way to work. And looking off to the side of the road, William was amazed to see a smooth, but sort of weathered looking, metallic cigar shaped craft hovering pretty close, about 750 feet away. He estimates it was about 70 feet long, 40 feet wide, and he could see it was unusual, so he stopped his car and uh, approached. He's, at this point, he was about 300 feet away, and he could now see that this object did, in fact, have a row of large portholes going along the edge. And this is where it got really interesting, because looking inside, he was amazed to see this pulsating blue light and at the very front, the silhouette of a man. He did not appear to be moving, but in the midsection through the portholes, he could see all kinds of movement, but he couldn't quite make out what was going on. Now this craft was very low. It was rocking sort of up and down. It was about 10 feet above the ground and he was close enough that he could hear a low throbbing sound. And here's where it gets even stranger. He could see what appeared to be small propellers on either end of the craft. So he watched this for about one minute, and at one point he slammed his car door shut. And at this point, the object suddenly increased in pitch. It made a louder noise. In fact, William said it sounded, quote, like a covey of a hundred quail taking off. The craft then rose vertically and went up into the clouds. So he went to his place of employment, told everyone what happened. They believed him. He's got a good reputation. The police were called. They went back to the area that day. And this is when they did, in fact, find what appeared to be a 60-foot wide circle of crushed vegetation. And this case did get a lot of attention. And in fact, Project Blue Book, headed by the Air Force, sent officers to investigate the case. And as you can see here, they had a big file on it. And everyone that they talked to vouched for William Squire's honesty and integrity. Uh, Project Blue Book officers were unable to explain the case, and they actually declared it unknown. It's one of very few cases involving humanoids that they declared unidentified. So he was apparently interviewed at length by Air Force officers. And as William Squires says in his own words, 
They're not about to make me retract this information. I'm not going to let them give me shots or anything else to make me say I didn't see it. So this is an interesting case for a number of reasons. There's a humanoid involved. There's landing traces. The Air Force showed a strong interest in this case. And what I'd like to do is play a little segment of audio tape where William Squires describes his experience in his own words. This is about three minutes long. It's pretty short, but I think you'll find it interesting. Last Monday morning, Bill Squires, an employee of radio station KOAM in Pittsburgh, Kansas, reported a very strange experience to authorities. Today, I spoke with him about it on long-distance telephone. Here is the story as he told it to me. Radio program at... Uh... Now move to the 1960s, and the case I chose for the 1960s occurred on July 21st, 1967, to a teenager by the name of Ronnie Hill. This is a pretty controversial case, but so interesting because it involves a photograph of an apparent humanoid. Ronnie was in the backyard of his parents' home. This is an oriental North Carolina, a tiny little town along the coast, and he says he was working in the garden when this happened. This is around uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And Ronnie says in his own words, I noticed a strange odor in the air which smelled like gas, which caused my eyes to water. At the same time that he smelled this strange odor, he says all the animal sounds suddenly stopped and an eerie silence settled over the area. So he's looking around but doesn't see anything unusual, so just kept working. But then something did happen, as Ronnie says, and I quote, After about 15 minutes, I heard a buzzing sound and the increasing smell of gas. When I turned my head, I saw a strange thing in the sky. It looked like a black hat. Then my eyes caught a glimpse of something moving. It was a white ball, 
about nine feet in diameter. It started to fly by itself. I fell to the ground, all sorts of things dashing through my mind. So as he watched, this thing was moving around and he realized this was apparently a UFO. Uh, he could hardly believe it, but he did have a Kodak camera in his house. So he ran inside, grabbed the camera, got out, and by the time he got outside, this white sphere that he had seen darting around had actually landed, he says, on the ground. And he's looking at it, and as he says, about five seconds later, I heard a loud noise which hurt my ears. I was breathless because a little man, about three and a half to four feet tall, came from behind the ball-shaped object, carrying with him a funnel-shaped black object in his right hand. Now Ronnie quickly took a picture, which you can see here, and he said this figure wore a skin-tight, silvery metallic suit with a blue belt around its waist. It had a metallic helmet, and he says he could see its face, which seemed to be sort of a brownish or bluish green in color. He said it had tilted or slanted eyes. And as he watched this figure, it seemed to walk in a way that he described as slowly and wobbly on stiff legs. It placed this black funnel, which you can see in its right hand, briefly on the ground, pulled it back up, and then quickly returned into this sphere. Seconds later, the object made a loud noise. A blue light came from beneath this object, which rose up. At this point, a bigger ship reappeared, the black object that he originally saw, and this smaller sphere went inside the bigger one. So he ran inside, told his parents what happened. Uh, they believed him. He's got a good reputation. And they developed the photo, and this is when they saw that he had, in fact, captured an image of this apparent E.T. Now Ronnie's case was investigated by John Keel, who was quite impressed. He sent the photograph to photographic analysts and they found no apparent evidence of hoaxing. And they started interviewing everybody and Ronnie's family, his teachers, and the adult leader of his local 4-H club all vouched for his honesty. And they even signed affidavits attesting to this. Now, Ronnie was apparently a pretty good witness. He himself was the president of his 8th grade class, the president of his local 4-H club, and the assistant patrol leader in the Boy Scouts. So this was very interesting. He didn't receive any money for this photo, so apparently there was no reason for him to financially gain from this. The family really wanted privacy. They did not want their location known. However, this case is not without some dissenters. Later, the group IQFAN, run by Coleman von Kavitsky, who himself has some detractors, he said that their analysis showed that this object wasn't nine feet tall that it was probably a smaller object. They believed it was an egg and that the alien figure was actually a doll wrapped in tinfoil. They did not really give any reasons why they came to this conclusion. However, another analysis by a photographic expert, uh, Andre Duarte, said that the height ratios described by the witness don't match what is showing in the photo. So yeah, there are some who believe this is a hoax, uh, and others do not. It is a controversial case. Apparently the main witness in the family have never retracted, though they faded from the limelight. So you can make of it what you will. It's an interesting case either way. Now the case I chose for the 1970s comes from British researchers Jenny Randalls and Paul Wetnall. They've written a number of books together. This occurred on a cold night in January, January 27, 1978. And the main witnesses are four teenagers, aged 17 to 19. 
They've insisted upon anonymity. Uh, and this incident occurred when they decided to trespass onto a farmer's property east of the small town of Frodsham, England. They were going hunting for pheasants. And they chose an area alongside the River Weaver, popularly known as the Devil's Garden, pictured here. And they were waiting in the bushes for pheasants to appear when they saw a metallic sphere with flashing lights, small squarish portholes, and a round sort of skirt or pan-shaped structure on the bottom section traveling just above the river's surface, maybe about 20 feet high. And they first thought it might be some sort of satellite, even though this is very low and going right above the water there. Uh, it was about 10 feet in diameter, they think, and they said it was making a soft humming and whooshing noise as it left the river and started moving towards them quite close. They could see flames coming out from the bottom as it landed in a field just a short distance away. Now they could see this violet light coming from the windows. And they said it was painful to look at. It hurt their eyes. And when this object landed, there were some cows grazing nearby. And they all became completely frozen, standing absolutely still. They couldn't say if this was just out of fear or if it was some effect from the object. So this alarmed them, and they became even more frightened and amazed when a figure came up from behind the craft. And this was a normal-looking humanoid. Uh, they couldn't really tell what he looked like because he was dressed in a one-piece silver suit. They could see a headlight on the helmet emitting the same type of painful violet light that was coming from the portholes of the craft. So it's dark. It's hard for them to make out everything. But they watched this figure walk around the area of the craft. It appeared to be surveying the scene, making sure everything was safe. It then re-entered into it, and moments later, two figures came out, and they were carrying something quite strange. It looked, the witnesses says, like a rectangular-shaped metallic cage. It was apparently not very heavy, judging by the way they were easily able to maneuver it and lift it. And they walked over to one of the cows, which still stayed completely still. And they sort of adjusted this cage over the cow. And it looked almost as if they were measuring this cow. They weren't quite sure what was happening here. However, as one of the witnesses says, We ran down to the bridge, but two men with funny lights on their caps came out, and I got scared. They had a cow in a cage, and we're doing something to it. I ran down to Ellis Lane. Another witness says, regarding the contraption, it was a frame of aluminum or silvery metal, and there were bars around the cow. They were measuring the height and length. So yeah, this kind of freaked them out, and fearing that they might be next, they fled the scene. And this is when they noticed a very strange effect. Some of the witnesses, when being interviewed, were kind of reticent to talk about it. One said that they had a funny feeling pulling on them. Another said it was a strange tingling. But one boy was very graphic, and he basically said he felt a strange tugging sensation on his privates as they left the area, and that afterwards his legs were red and sore, as if sunburned for a few days after the incident. So yeah, these are physiological effects and quite unusual. And yeah, it's a strange case. They ran over the bridge back into the town of Frodsham and left the area. Uh, they were interviewed, but they declined to be interviewed further, uh, did not want to talk about it. Researchers Jenny Randalls and Paul Wetnall had some trouble getting this case investigated and published. They said that the, their notes on the case were mysteriously waylaid twice, once they were sent through the Postal Service and apparently became lost. And several months later, the envelope came back apparently opened and resealed. So they did a write-up on this case and sent it to the Flying Saucer Journal, published in England, and they said they never received it. So they had to send it again, and this case was eventually published. 
Now, there were apparently no other witnesses who saw this, but there were, in fact, several other reports of UFOs in that month in nearby areas. There was a little bit of a wave going on. Uh, apparently, no one returned to the actual site to check for landing traces or missing cows, and as the witnesses insisted upon anonymity and refused requests for further interviews, there's no more information on this case. And now we move to the 1980s. This is probably my favorite case of all of these that I'm presenting today. And this next case occurred near the town of Romney in West Virginia, more specifically in Slainsville. It was March 22nd, 1982. It was around 4 a.m. And the main witness, Donald Shalcross, had been working the late shift at County Emergency Medical Services. Donald is also a former park ranger. Now he had just gone inside his house when his dogs and cats were acting up and he thought maybe there was an animal or something in the yard. So he went outside and as he says, I saw this purple light moving across the field. I thought a plane had crashed. So I yelled at my wife and daughter to call the police and drove out to there to see what had happened. He hopped in his car and drove just a short distance towards this light down this dirt road and his car engine conked out. He didn't think much of that. He quickly grabbed a flashlight and went hiking into this field towards this light. At this point all he could see was a glowing light but he realized at this point it probably wasn't a plane. He wasn't sure he didn't get a good look at it at first because his flashlight was pointing down onto the ground so he could make his way through this field and right in front of him he saw something very strange and as Donald says in his own words I saw a pair of feet my light jerked up and there was a person standing there now he thought at first that this might be the pilot who had crawled from the wreckage of this plane crash but he instantly changed his mind because this was no normal pilot. As Donald says in his own words, suddenly a numb feeling overcame my body. I realized this was no ordinary pilot. He was five feet, three or four inches tall, slender, and wearing a silvery suit. It covered him all over, boots, gloves, everything. His head looked pretty normal, except I couldn't see any ears and his eyes and nose were covered by a visor, like on a motorcycle helmet. Uh, he held a rod about the length of a baseball bat. Now you can see a drawing here, which Donald did, in fact, approve as being accurate. So he was beginning to wonder at this point who this man was and what was going on. And he asked out loud verbally, Are you okay? The figure didn't respond. He asked again, no response. And then, at this point, this figure started talking to him, not out loud, but telepathically, and started answering Donald's questions as quickly as he thought him. As Donald says, I saw things in my mind. The words and the images were just there. It was not normal talking. Whatever he said came directly into my mind as if he were able to convey his thoughts to me through mental telepathy. And this is when a very interesting conversation ensued. Uh, Donald asked who this figure was, and the figure said, I am a watch guard. Where are you from? Donald asked. The figure replied, not from here. Have you been here before? Donald asked. And the figure said, many times. Donald asked the same ones, and the figure said, others also before. So this guy was not talking normally. Not only was it telepathic, but according to Donald, all the answers from this figure were very short, very concise. And at this point, he realized he was talking to an actual extraterrestrial, an alien. And he asked him, why haven't you made yourselves known? The ET said, we are known. Donald asked, why are you here? The ET replied, there are things everybody needs to know. Donald asked, what things? And the ET basically said, according to Donald, 
that his people had been watching Earth for some time and were very concerned about our misuse of atomic energy and the way we are disposing of atomic waste. He said that it was, quote, creating problems we do not know of. Uh, the ET said that atomic energy should be used for power, not for destructive purposes or dominating others. He also said that humans need to stop using up the resources of Earth. E.T. said that their craft do, in fact, use nuclear power, but they know how to dispose of the waste safely. So it told him other strange things, that there is technology stored and hidden in the Egyptian pyramids. And Donald's hearing all this and basically said to the E.T., you know, why are you telling me this? I'm not the right person to talk to. How do they expect him to fix these problems? And the ET replied, I will tell you how to dispose of your wastes and your atomic wastes so that they will not pollute the earth. Now Donald believes he was given more information. Some of this he remembered later. He did ask about God. And the being said that, yes, God is real. Uh, so one of the reasons Donald became uh, had some trouble recalling all this is because at this point something very strange started to happen. He found himself sort of floating along with the ET towards the craft, and this caused him quite quite a bit of fear. As Donald says, we were moving the whole time. I was I was petrified. I'm scared to death. I was shaking so hard. I thought I was going to vomit. All at once, Donald says, I was three or four feet away from a UFO. Before, it had only been two lights off in the distance, but now I could see this craft real close. It was like a cereal bowl with another turned upside on top of it, linked by an inner tube. It was hovering about five or six feet in the air. And there was no noise. I could see a purple color on top. The ET told him, our people will return. At this point, a door opened in the craft, emitting a purple light, which Donald said actually gave off heat. He felt a burning sensation. A little ramp came down. The figure went right up into the craft. The door closed. The middle band surrounding the perimeter of the craft lit up, and this craft went straight up and darted away. So Donald was pretty disoriented and amazed at this point. He walked back to his car, and by the time he made it there, he was surprised to see the police and a local rescue squad waiting there for him. He told them what had just happened. All of them went back to the spot where the UFO had hovered, nearly landed, but saw nothing. Uh, the policeman did say that at least two other people had called into the station that night reporting strange lights or what they thought was a plane about to crash, but they had declined to investigate these reports, which is too bad. Could have been more witnesses. The next day, Donald woke up to find that his skin, which had been exposed to this light, was now sunburned. And over the next few days, it actually blistered and peeled, and he said that his eyes also became sore and red. So this case caused quite a sensation. Researcher Gray Barker did an investigation, and as he says, after interviewing him for hours, I'm absolutely convinced he is tr telling the truth. It's one of the best contact stories I've ever heard. Now, he was given a lie detector test by expert Carmen Pelosi uh, of New York. And, of course, he did pass this lie detector test. And as Carmine says, this is basically the testimony of an honest man. So Donald is standing by his story. He allowed himself to be interviewed multiple times. And as he says, I know what I saw. I have good vision. I don't drink either. But it's too important not to tell some, somebody. Hopefully the right kind of people will see it. He said this encounter affected him profoundly. Not only did it change his worldview and convince him that UFOs and ETs are real and visiting our planet, 
but he went on a quest to learn the meaning of his experience. He began to speculate on the possibility of an underground base in the area. He developed a strong interest in pyramids, and he says that his intelligence itself seemed to be boosted, and that he was guided to find the information he needed to explore his experience. It's really quite a remarkable case. Now moving along to the 1990s, this next case comes from researcher Cynthia Hind, and it occurred in an area known as Chipadzi. This is in South Africa near the town of Mindura. This occurred on March 6, 1996, and the main witness is Lloyd Karambukawa. And at the time, he was 17 years old when this happened. He was going to Herman Gminer Secondary School. And it was on, again, March 6, when Lloyd woke up in his home in Chipadzi. It was around 1 a.m. And he was hearing this strange clicking noise coming from outside. Now, he was alone in the house. His mom was visiting his sister. So Lloyd had no one else to uh, help him out with this and this sound was strange enough that he hesitated to go outside and investigate it but finally curiosity overcame his fear and he stepped outside walked into the street but at this point the sound stopped as he says the sound frightened me a lot so he went back inside turned off the lights and lay in bed for about 10 minutes when the sound started up again and this time he could tell where it was coming from. It was coming directly from across the street where there's a woman's training center. So he crept outside of the house, hid behind the hedge right in front of his house, and looked across the street. And this is when he saw something that he said sent chills down his spine. As Lloyd says, I could see this thing about two meters away from me. I nearly died of shock. I had never seen such a thing. I wish I had not seen it. I saw a completely white, short, fast-moving, mysterious thing. It was about one and a half meters tall. So that's about four and a half feet. As Lloyd says, when I first took a glance at the thing, I nearly collapsed because I had never seen such a person with such a head. The head was like a rugby ball or an egg. It had a satchel on its back and attached to that was an aerial and a small red light. And he could see now that this weird clicking sound was actually coming from this figure. And he watched it for just a few moments, but became overcome with fear. He ran back inside, went to his bed, and actually hid under the blankets. Uh, the next morning, he went out there and found some very interesting evidence, some strange circular footprints which were fairly large. There were five sets of them set in the soft sand. Uh, so you could see that this thing was walking around. Uh, he went to school that day, told his classmates, and that's when he learned that a security guard at the women's training center had actually seen the same thing. The guard is a woman by the name of Kambudzai Gwesh, and she confirmed that this incident did occur somewhere between 1 and 2 a.m., she also heard this strange clicking sound and went outside to investigate and saw apparently the same short figure in a white suit, she said. She described it as looking, quote, unpleasant, <laughs> so it scared her. And as she watched, its body seemed to glow with rainbow-like colors. And it was clear to her that this was not human. It didn't look human. She said its face almost looked more animalistic. And this frightened her so badly that she ran inside and refused to come out. She actually quit her job the next day. She absolutely refused to do nighttime guard duty, quit her job as a security guard, and went to work for the local cotton factory. So this impressed both witnesses. And Lloyd was not happy about it afterwards. As he says in his own words, I wish I had not seen it, even now. That night still makes me feel timid if I think of all that happened. So yeah, it can be quite a traumatic experience to see something that close up. 
Now here's another case. This one occurred in the 2000s, and it comes from Brazilian researcher Tiago Luiz Tichetti. He's very well known for investigating cases in Brazil. And this one occurred in March of 2001 in Brazil. There are two witnesses, Vinicius da Silva and Marta Rosenthal. This is quite a brief case, but interesting for sure. Vinicius and Marta were returning home from a day of fishing along the river Tocantins, pictured here, when they felt a bump in one of their tires. So they thought they had a flat tire, and Vinicius exited the vehicle, inspected the tires, but couldn't find anything wrong. But at this point, Marta began screaming and pointing to the right, and there, only a few meters away, hovering over the waters of the Tocantins River, was a metallic object. It had small windows or portholes along the edge, and standing outside the object on a ledge was a humanoid figure about 1.3 meters in, in height, so maybe four feet tall or so. And this figure was holding a hose which reached all the way to the water and it was apparently sucking up water from the river and into the craft. So while this technically isn't a landing, part of this object is touching the earth or the water, so I think it qualifies. And they watched this for about two minutes, at which point the humanoid pulled up the hose-like device from the river, re-entered the object, this craft then became very bright and shot away horizontally and upwards into the sky and disappeared in the distance. So this is one of many cases where UFOs are seen taking water. And I think it's interesting because this illustrates an, a pattern of UFO behavior. Uh, they apparently are interested in water and have uses for it, which is no surprise. And now we get to the last case, and one of the most interesting as well. And this occurred in Ica, Peru, more specifically in the Okukahe Desert. This occurred in 2011, one evening, and the main witness is a university professor, an engineer, and a paleontologist by the name of Klaus Hanninger. He's quite well known as a paleontologist and he was sitting around the campfire with several other scientists. His wife was there, it was a clear sky, when suddenly everyone in the group saw, right about 300 meters away, under a thousand feet, on the top of a small hill, a bright light that was rising up from the ground, apparently, and into the sky. And according to Klaus, this light was on a, quote, long object about 100 meters in length. So a big 300 foot long craft. And this object or light remained stationary right above the hill. And they watched in awe as several smaller lights or orbs began to exit this larger object. And according to the witnesses, they counted about 14 of these smaller glowing orbs or spheres which began to fly around in all different directions at very high speeds. And according to Klaus, after a while, one of these small orbs approached to within 150 feet of the group. It then descended very close to them, actually lighting up the desert floor. They had the impression it was searching for something. But just a few minutes later, these spheres began to return to the larger object, coming from all directions and re-entering into it. At this point, this larger object then descended behind the hill, disappearing from sight, but apparently landing, because it was immediately after this that Klaus noticed the presence of two strange beings that were not human. And he walked partially away from the group, while these figures walked up to him. And yeah, they were not human, <laughs> as Klaus says. They had a long head. It was a round head that ended a little pointed. They were thin with very long arms that reached almost to the knees. I estimate that they would have been around 2.2 meters to 2.3 meters high. So quite tall, over six feet, 
uh, six and a half, seven feet even. And it really interested him because their skulls looked very much like the elongated skulls that had been found in areas nearby and that he was researching. So he says he became extremely emotional while in the presence of these beings. And he started speaking to them telepathically. At first he didn't remember the whole conversation, but those who were in the group did. They could see him talking to these guys. He did later remember this conversation. But he does remember asking these beings all telepathically where they were from and if they were indeed extraterrestrials. And they told him that they were actually from Earth and had been living amongst us uh, for thousands of years and that they had been here long before humans arrived. They told him, we are your brothers. And as Klaus says in his own words, their appearance was undoubtedly different from ours. They had elongated heads, very thin, with long arms and legs. From the darkness, we only noticed that they were a light color. We didn't notice a mouth or nose, just very large eyes. For some reason I can't explain, I approached about 10 meters from them, and I had a mental communication, I suppose telepathic, where they told me not to be afraid, and that they were not going to hurt me. And for about 10 minutes, there was a fluid communication that, in short, I was made to understand that they did not come from another planet, but lived thousands of years ago on Earth. The biggest concern they have is how we are destroying the planet and putting at risk the habitat they have here. So after this short conversation, Klaus turned to his companions and said, don't be afraid that these beings are not here to hurt them. However, his wife was not a happy camper because when she saw these figures approaching her husband, she suffered an apparent nervous breakdown. And it was shortly after this conversation that both beings stopped, they looked at each other briefly, turned around, and left. So it was about two to four minutes afterwards that these figures had disappeared that this craft or a similar craft from behind the hill came up, shot up into the sky, and quickly disappeared from sight. And here's what makes this case even more interesting. Klaus Honinger managed to take a photo of this craft. So that is very unusual. And uh, as Klaus said, he initially kept this secret but decided that he was going to come forward. And as he says, I am not interested if people believe in the encounter or think I am crazy. I had that encounter in 2010 with two beings in the middle of the desert of Ica, which I will never forget. And I assume it as an important milestone in my life. Before that, the extraterrestrial subject was not one that moved my interest. I assumed logically that there must be life on other planets, but what I experienced confirmed this assumption. And he ended up publicly lecturing and doing presentations on his experience and his encounters, because he did have more encounters after this with human-looking ETs. And again, yeah, he wanted to keep quiet at first, but decided he would go public, because as he says, for years, I thought about the reasons why I was contacted and that this fact was not to be left in a closed circle, but so that the people around me would find out about it and open their minds to a reality which has been hidden centuries ago. So he bravely stepped forward and another very interesting aspect to this encounter is that following this, Klaus Honinger became a fierce environmentalist. That's certainly a pattern we do see in a lot of these cases. It's an incredible encounter. Those are all the cases that I wanted to present today. And again, as I often say, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of cases 
like these. I love the humanoid and landing cases because they do provide a lot of information. And as you can see, again, these cases are worldwide and ongoing for a very long time. And I think that they have a lot to say about the UFO phenomenon. And as you can see, these messages are very consistent. The ETs are very concerned about our planet, our use of nuclear power, the way we're destroying our environment, the way we mistreat each other. So these are good messages and hopefully we will listen. So thanks very much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers, keep looking for the truth, and most important of all, Keep having fun. Bye now.